Remind me to never make Jake Browning mad. I don't even want to chop veggies near him out of fear of accidentally cutting that man. Now week 15 featured three Saturday games. Everyone in the AFC South has hope except the eliminated Titans. Everyone has an awesome backup quarterback, except the Steelers and Vikings, and the Bills are back. And Aaron Rodgers officially transcended human biology for nothing. I'll reveal the real winners and losers from NFL Week 15 right after the Blop 10 plays. A top 10 segment so hot, they won't even allow it to be shown in prisons. What do you think we are, animals? Oh! What are we? Blop 10, Steelers receivers continuing to be the worst team players on earth. George Pickens run blocking effort is so low, I'm going to start talking relentless crap to him on Twitter because I know he won't be able to block me. Blop 9, Commanders fans consider punter Tressway the best player on their team. Unfortunately for Tress, he got a little banged up trying to feel the snap that was born to be a Blop 10 play, as the long snapper getting cut this week would also suggest. Blop 8, Tucker Craft tried to hurdle a Bucks defender and got hit squarely in the dick, penis, and balls. And if my memory serves me right, Crafts are supposed to get their crotches massaged not destroyed. Blop 7. This completion by Lamar Jackson was not very probable, but it was still extremely likely. <laughs> Lamar Jackson should be credited with about 20 forced missed tackles in this game. Blop 6. Kelsey flops and Tony drops another pass. Many will note Taylor Swift's reaction after Kelsey flopping, but to her right is Alana Heim, who's currently dating Andy Reid per TMZ. Number five, Darnell Mooney let victory bounce in and out of his hands on a Hail Mary that would have given Chicago a miraculous win. When the hell did Cleveland become lucky? What has the world come to? I think I'll worry though when the Bears become lucky. After the game, David Njoku said he nearly shit himself watching the play. I nearly shit myself, dog. <laughs> so, Dan Campbell, ahead of his time. Wear a diaper. Block four. Joe Buck saying analytics don't factor in for Drew Locke. Analytics says this is a go for it situation, two yards or less, but that does not factor in Drew Locke. Ballsy thing to say during the year of the backup, Joe. Block three. Some people are saying this Nick Mullins throw is the worst interception in NFL history. May I remind you of this interception? Hell, that's not even the worst interception I've seen a Vikings quarterback throw. <gasps> Favre was robbed so many times during his career, maybe that's why he thought he could steal welfare money for volleyball courts. BJ Hill, by the way, who got the pick, has picks and back-to-back -back games. Welcome to BJ Island. Oh, that sounds nice. The first shutdown nose tackle in NFL history. Blop 2, the attendance in rainy Charlotte, North Carolina made it look like 2020 all over again. The fans that did show up to see the Panthers get their second win were quoted as saying, There are dozens of us. And number one, Trevor Lawrence's fumble in the red zone on Sunday night. What the hell is this, Trevor? Nobody touched you. Three things that don't exist that could have caused this fumble. The Jets playoff chances, Manti Teo's girlfriend, and of course the body part on Dion Lewis that touched Miles Jack down. Today's episode is sponsored by Good Chop. And my code, that's good120. That code is gonna get you $120 off your first four boxes of Good Chop. Now I've been rocking with Good Chop since the spring, as you can see by this montage of meat. Why do I love Good Chop? Well, in the eight months of meat boxes I've received, I've never gotten a cut that didn't achieve my very, very high meat standard. All of the food is sourced from the US of A, and you can customize your box with 100% grass-fed ribeyes, T-bones, wild-caught salmon, and free-range and organic chicken. Plus, they've got pork tenderloin. The list goes on and on. None of the beef ever has antibiotics or added hormones, and that's important to me because I eat a lot of it. 
And on nights where my wife Jess just wants her pasta fix, I pop in a couple salmon pieces and eat that for a quick meal. You pick a box size, you select which meats you want in that box, and then it arrives at your doorstep. Which is great during the holidays while you've got a million things going on. So go to goodshop.com slash YouTube and use my code that's good 120 for $120 off your first four boxes. The AFC South just got real fucking weird with that Jags loss. And sadly, Trevor Lawrence not only gets my blop one, he and Brandon McManus share my blop zero. Their first two trips into the scoring zone resulted in zero points because Brandon McManus missed both of his field goal attempts, including a massive doink, which confirms my theory that the NFL will only allow one good kicker to be named Brandon at any given moment. The real gap in this game though came right before halftime. The Ravens just scored a touchdown to take a 10-0 lead, but T-Law and the Jags put together a nice drive in the two-minute drill all the way to the point of the final two plays where they were good enough to get this close in goal-to-goal situation where they opted to not clock the play, which is fine, but then Trevor Lawrence throws a completion into no man's land, and they run out of time. Trevor Lawrence suffered a concussion late in the fourth quarter, but if I'm Trevor Lawrence, after that play, I say I got a concussion in the locker room before the game started. Running back Keaton Mitchell for the Ravens suffered a nasty knee injury, one so bad he may miss time next year, which sucks because he's awesome, and the Ravens had the quietest 250 rushing yards in a game I've ever seen. Winning revenge artist? Jake Browning. Now I knew that the Vikings had cut Jake Browning because I did a full video about him, but I had no idea they were so shitty to him when they let him go. You know, they didn't even, they didn't tell me. Like I'd been there for two years and you know, I've been cut my fair share of times and that was probably the shittiest one. The fact that Browning started slow, got absolutely rocked, possibly browning his own undies, and then led three touchdown drives in the fourth quarter to tie this game up makes me think the Bengals could win the Super Bowl with a backup in Brown Town. Hell, even Nick Mullins, who was horribly entertaining while completing some of the dumbest throws of all time, fired a clutch TD to Jordan Addison in the fourth quarter to make this a wild game. But it was the winning hands of Chai T. Higgins available at benchwarmerbrew.com that won the Bengals this game. Now, T. Higgins been uh, uncharacteristically quiet in a contract year, but made himself a shit ton of money in the Bengals win over the Vikings. Higgins had a couple touchdowns. One was a pretty garden variety TD, but the second score may have been the most impressive effort I have seen all year. And if a normal person tried this, their arm would snap completely off their body. Higgins has under 500 yards this season, but he's going to be the X factor for the Bengals as they make a playoff run minus Joe Burrow and potentially Jamar Chase for the time being. And of course, we should all have a mother who's willing to defend their son like this. Winning mom, yeah, T. Higgins' mom. Still elite, Joe Flacco. Only elite quarterbacks can start a game with three picks and then get the win by going 11 of 13 for 212 yards in the fourth quarter. Flacco was the only QB to throw for two hundo in the fourth quarter this season. Now Joe Flacco and Amari Cooper connected for the game tying touchdown, which isn't the craziest pass and catch we saw this week. Or hell, even in this game, that belongs to David Njoku's touchdown grab in the first half. But this might be the prettiest TD we've seen. Just a thing of beauty. David Njoku is having an insane season, and I love that Flacco is getting him the ball, and Joku's catch an angry run on third and 15 is why Cleveland ended up winning this one. Well, that and Darnell Mooney's inability to catch the ball while sitting on the ground. Only if the Browns had BJ Island in for this Hail Mary attempt. I gotta be on offense now. Anytime someone tries to tell me that Justin Fields sucks, I'm just going to show them this play and this drop by Bob Tunyon. Fields was almost my Kirk Cousins award winner this week. Least important game? Yeah, Falcons-Panthers. 
Ugh. Adam Thielen dropped a touchdown. Bryce Young threw zero touchdowns for less than 200 yards, was sacked three times, and that was still enough to best Desmond Ritter, who could have won the game but totally didn't because he threw this pick in the red zone. And the Panthers got just their second win of the season. My winning QB? Any quarterback facing a Joe Barry defense. Baker Mayfield gets it this week. He's the most underappreciated QB in the NFL this season. Partly because he's actually stayed healthy, unlike just about every other QB, but also because he's throwing darts. Like this pass to Mike Evans, who tried to give the ball to a friendly pirate in the stands, but the nerd working security got jealous and had to take it away. I'm calling the Anti-Pirate Defamation League and filing a report. Baker was damn near immaculate against the Packers, who probably all want Joe Barry to walk the plank after this game. 79% completions for Baker. 181 yards, four tutties, and no picks. Baker also became the first visiting quarterback to have a perfect passer rating at Lambeau Field. Not to mention, he's got the best signals of any quarterback. Wow, he's really matured since his college days. And most importantly, he's got the Bucks in first place in the godforsaken NFC South. The Packers defense was so bad, I can't even highlight Jordan Love's best professional pass, a corner heater to Jordan Reed. Maybe Wisconsin schools will use this play to encourage kids to learn to read. Losing quarterback, unfortunately, I have to give this to Will Levis, in the game where the Houston Texans played the Houston Oilers. They battled their past and won or and, and lost. The Texans, what? Can the Texans have their uniforms back? This is confusing. In a game where Case Keenum gifted his team a pick six, Levis was also sacked seven times, tying Tommy Cutlets for most taken, and I just really wanted to see more from Will, like Elijah Molden's will to live after this celebration. Dalton Schultz ripped away an interception to set up Houston for the game-tying touchdown, and if T. Higgins was never born, that may have been the clutch catch of the week. Shit is officially interesting in the AFC South, with eight and six being the shared record between Houston, Indy, and Jacksonville. The Texans survived the week without Stroud and have two key games against the Browns and Colts to finish out the season after notching a key OT win against Tennessee, Houston Texan, Euler Titans. With Christmas approaching, it's fair to give big time love for winners, Christians. Christian McCaffrey had three touchdowns in a 45-29 win against the Cardinals, putting him at 20 on the season, which is tied for the lead league with Raheem Mostert, who just happens to have been a 49er himself. On one of those touchdowns, uh, McCaffrey got so wide open that he had time to fall down, get back up, and still walk into the end zone. The only other guy I saw that wide open this week was also a white Christian, Cooper Cup. He really should have spiked the ball in the end zone as a reminder to never leave your cup unattended. Now in two games this season, McCaffrey has scored seven touchdowns against Arizona, which is tied for the most of any player against a team in a single season. The last time someone did that was all the way back in 2013 when Jamal Charles had seven against the Raiders, which, of course, is inflated by the fact that they were the 2013 Raiders. If McCaffrey can score three more touchdowns in the final three games, he will tie Jerry Rice's franchise record for touchdowns in a season. After a pretty rough game from Dak Prescott and an injury to Tyree Kill, you have to put CMC at the front of the MVP race. Brock Purdy thinks so too. I think Christian should be MVP. I think I, I really do believe that. You know, he does everything um, for us. Runs the ball well. Can catch the ball. He does everything. You know, I'm the guy that hands on the ball off, and then I turn back and and watch. My Kirk Cousins award, uh, Jacoby Brissett, who came into the game in the fourth quarter in relief of Sam Howell and immediately looked like the best QB on the team. And I'm saying that as someone who likes Sam Howell a lot or at least enjoys watching Sam Howell play. He's like Jameis Winston without the baggage. But after Howell misfired on 15 of his 26 passes, Brissett was accurate and efficient, hitting on eight of 10 throws for 124 yards, including a pair of touchdowns to Terry McLaurin and Curtis Samuel. McLaurin, by the way, had 141 yards, by far his best game of the season, drawing the commies within a score to end the game after they were down 28 to seven, where Cooper Cup 
smartly swatted the onside kick out of bounds. A final cup and beer pong's always the toughest, isn't it? Jacoby Brissett also posed one of the greatest questions of all time back in 2019 when he asked, if the sun is hot, how is outer space cold? And you know what? I don't think Neil deGrasse Tyson could answer that question. Water, fire, air, and dirt. Fucking magnets, how do they work? Brissett was hotter than the sun in the fourth quarter, and I'm guessing he'll be getting a starting role next week. Losing stat, Derrick Henry became the first player in NFL history to have at least 20 touches in a single game and produce fewer than 15 yards from scrimmage. See, the original tweet says less, but as a man of perfect grammar, I know that fewer is the correct wordage. Winners, the Chiefs, who may or may not be back because Andy Reid is once again drawing up candy ass plays in the red zone. And they're working again. The fact that this counts as a passing touchdown for Jarek McKinnon is a crime against fantasy football, which the Chiefs are now rigging. Me and Jet kind of talked before the huddle because uh, he knew what I needed to get, you know, receiving touchdown. We really would have handed that ball off, but Jet got his receiving, you know, his passing yards and I got my receiving <laughs> touchdown. But that, of course, doesn't change the fact that Patty Mahomes still hates Kadarius Tony with a burning passion. The last person to fuck up Mahomes and his image was his brother Jackson, and he has since been wiped off the face of the earth. Hold on a second, was Jackson Mahomes the key to Patrick Mahomes' success? Steven Belichick looks the way I assume Joe Barry coaches. Boom, roasted. Winners, the NFL officials who didn't fall for the Travis Kelsey flop in the end zone. The only thing that fell was the ball through Kelsey's hands. Losing team, the New York Jets who were one win away from sticking around in the playoff hunt and potentially activating Aaron Rodgers for the rest of the season, if for no other reason than to see how an Achilles holds up after being patched up with vibes and flex seal back in September. With their season on the line, the Jets responded by putting up exactly zero points against the Dolphins. Tua was playing without Tyreek Hill at his disposal and still completed 21 to 24 passes passes while Zach Wilson could barely muster two yards per attempt before he left the game. Probably didn't help that he was pressured on 12 of his 16 dropbacks. And I have one question for Aaron Rodgers. Is this really the line you want to test out that Achilles with? I say no. Side note, Raheem Mostert, who was again tied with McCaffrey this season, 20 touchdowns. That is crazy. And Jalen Waddle carried the load with 142 yards against that Jets defense in a shutout win. And welcome to Backup Watch, presented by Bench Warmer Brew. Backups, backups. Yes, the Steelers had many injuries in this game, but the Colts are in the playoffs and not the Steelers. And Indy's backups are better, winning five of their last six. They manhandled the Steelers with backup, backup running backs, Trey Sermon and Tyler Goodson after backup Zach Moss went down with an injury and my surprise performer receiver DJ Montgomery. Yeah, you guessed it, a backup receiver coming out of the USFL who balled there, had a soul crushing drop on fourth down in the end zone, but then totally redeemed himself on the next drive to put the fork in the Cook Steelers. Minshew's third TD pass came to Mo Alley Cox, reminding us all this gardener don't fuck with no hoes. He's all about those back alley cocks, bros. Losers, the Steelers, who are one and three and averaging just 14 points per game since firing Matthew Canada. Okay, maybe it doesn't help that Mitch Trubisky has been starting, but credit Mike Tomlin, who waited for the perfect moment to insert Mason Rudolph. Trailing 27-13 halfway through the fourth quarter. At 7-7, seven and, seven, and with games against the Red Hot Bengals and the Ravens, Mike Tomlin is finally in danger of suffering his first losing season as a head coach. The only person who can't see the Steelers not making the playoffs is Najee Harris. But that's because he has no vision. Don't blink. If you're a blinker, cut your eyelids off. Winning individual performer, James Ledham Cook who had the best game of his career in the Bills' 31-10 victory over the Cowboys. Cook had 179 yards on the ground, the second best rushing total of any player this season, and 221 yards from scrimmage, the third most of anyone in 2023. He was the reason Buffalo won by three touchdowns, despite Josh Allen throwing for under 100 yards. You know, 
felt like the, the kid that didn't do anything in the class project but got an A. Just look at how messy his carry chart is. It looks like a doctor filling out a prescription. That prescription, Viagra, because I'm as hard as a rock for the Bills again. The Bills got a fever, and the only prescription is more of their bell cow back. Cook could have had another touchdown if he could have held on to this pass, but he's one of several reasons that whichever AFC division winner draws the Bills at home in the wild card should be terrified to host this team. Deion Dawkins finishing blocks is another reason. They're starting to hit their stride at the per Perfect time. The broadcast made a special note a dozen times to highlight that brothers Stefan Diggs and Trayvon Diggs showed up together, really leaned into the whole family angle. Remember when Trayvon tweeted this though? That's not very family-like. And the Bills milked the clock like a prostate. Yeah, I could have said cow, but I didn't. Loser me for putting out a Tommy DeVito video 24 hours before a very rough game against the Saints. DeVito got absolutely crushed on this hit, was sacked seven times, but worst of all, they hurt his feelings. And my feelings, first of all, they don't even know his name. I ain't gonna lie, I didn't really know his um, name for like the first like four days of, or two days of film because I thought it was his name was Danny DeVito. <laughs> okay, that's actually hilarious. Honestly, the only QB I confused for the famously uh, four foot ten Danny DeVito is Kyler Murray. Losers, the Saints for discrimination. Anyone who opposes Tommy Cutlets opposes all Italians. Do you know what this is? That's anti-Italian discrimination. That's also how Italians do the the the, the jerk off signal. But guess what? It wasn't me who cursed Tommy Cutlets. It was Jimmy Fallon. When your man throws a bomb but still lives with his mom, that's DeVito. The Giants really have just one playmaker on offense, Saquon Barkley, and I knew this game was going to be bad when last week's hero, Randy Bullock, pulled his hammy doing the easiest part of his job kicking off. This would be like Tom Brady breaking his hand while taking a snap from under center. And yes, I already did a full Lions Broncos recap uh, on the new, 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 worst, whatever. One thing I didn't mention from that game was Jared Goff with his five TD passes made him and CJ Stroud to be the only quarterbacks this season to throw five touchdowns in a game. Not Tua. He only threw four against Denver back in week three. My real losing QB, Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts, in a game where he was sacked zero times, managed to pass a rating of 40, by far the lowest of the week, two picks, and nary a TD. He hasn't thrown a touchdown in the last three games, and in a week where Dak had the worst game of his season, Hurts was even worse. Apparently, he had the flu, so now we know for sure he and Mahomes are not good at football while having the flu. Which is how we know they are indeed human. But Monday night, Night was all about the conclusion of our glory. I want me some glory, ho. For backup QBs, every former Broncos quarterback won this week. Flacco, Keenum, and now my comeback kid, Drew Locke, who turned a boring and uneventful game into an amazing finish and heartwarming story. The man, formerly known as Horsecock Locke, got the ball back with a minute 52 on the clock, one timeout, trailing by four, starting on his own eight yard line. Everything started with this DK Metcalf butt catch. DK Met butt. All right, maybe that's a thigh, but I'm a butt man. In fact, this is the drive of winning catches going to the Seahawks ball catchers. DK did it again down the sideline in double coverage. How? How, DK? And then Drew Locke drops a dime where Jackson Smith and Jigba uses the very tips of his fingers to grab the game-winning TD, completing Seattle's longest drive of the season. Locke loved it. Gino loved it. And love? Well, Julian Love sealed the game with his second pick. Pete Carroll has never lost to the Eagles in the most lopsided bird matchup since Larry Bird dropped 60 on the Hawks. Drew Locke after the game gave us one of the best and most honest responses to getting a win as a starter turned backup we've seen since while Geno Smith week one last year. Just describe what you're feeling in your heart right now. Yeah. It's so hard. It's so hard to describe the feeling of, you know, not playing for so long, or at least what feels like a really long time to me. And then you sit there, you watch games, you wonder, can I do this still? I haven't been out there on the field. That's the human nature of it. You get back out there last week, I'm like, you know what? I'm the man, so I can go do this. And then you got another test this week where I didn't know if I was going to play or not. And the, the boys around me rallied tonight. 